General Coordinator of the International Community of Women Living with HIV and AIDS East Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Let's start with um, the law must have caught you off guard too. Well, uh, this act was a shock to us and uh, I must say it should be a shock to all Ugandans because the impacts that it will have are not only going to impact on only those who are fighting, who are working on HIV and AIDS in this country, but the impacts are going to go to every citizen in this country. Imp and Please. And so when we learned that the president had assented to this bill and it is now an act, it was a shock because there's a lot of work that had been put into this. There has been a lot of conversation. The president himself has been approached by so many stakeholders calling on him to make sure that he sends back the bill to parliament so that they look at the contentious clauses, which unfortunately did not happen. And, and, and I just learned that you are supposed to meet him uh, an, in an earlier date. Yes, yes. We were working towards uh, having a meeting with him and, and so are other stakeholders who have been, you know, working towards getting an appointment with him. Let's then discuss the bill itself. When you look at the bill, it, it brings some issues um, like attempted transmission, intentional transmission and those controversial issues what are those controversial issues that you are against in the in the in the law that you want that you wanted to be brought back to parliament just to our viewers uh, and listeners to say that uh, when you look at the bill it has good uh, articles and clauses that if we didn't have the contentious clauses that I'm going to speak to would be having a good law but uh, they are about four clauses that are really going to take us back as a country in our struggles against HIV and AIDS. And the first one is uh, Clause 13, which talks about routine testing, and it singles out uh, three categories of people. But the two main ones that it singles out is uh, routine testing for pregnant uh, mothers, women, and their partners. And this That is already being done now. You know, it takes us back because the policy the Ministry of Health policy now is routine testing for everybody so that everybody gets to know their status. If they're HIV uh, positive, they access treatment and other services. And even those who are not HIV positive, you know, get to know how to prevent further getting HIV infections. But this one is now taking us back a step forward to only concentrate on few individuals, which is going to be, a, you know, dangerous for this country. There's the, the, there's a, there's the issue of disclosure, and test that, disclosure. That is clause 18E, which talks about uh, disclosure, and it gives permission to healthcare workers who, in their opinion, if they think that the person who has come to them, whom they have tested and is HIV positive, in their opinion, if they feel that this person is a danger to anybody close to them, then they have the right to disclose. Isn't that fair enough of to course, prevent transmission? Uh, the danger here is that this is broad because it is talking about anybody that is in close contact with this person who is HIV positive. That if, for example, you have a maid, if you have a driver, if you go to a saloon, everywhere, if the health worker thinks that this person they have tested and is HIV positive is a danger to these people, they are going to disclose to them. So the implication here is that people are going to think twice before they go for testing. And yet our call has been let everybody test, know their status, so that we are able to prevent further infections in this country. The law, the law calls for a five-year sentence in jail for attempted transmission. Attempted transmission. Yes, attempted transmission is another uh, critical clause that we are looking at that you have actually you have not transmitted HIV to anybody but any attempt if you're HIV positive then you can be taken to have attempted and if for example you're in a close relationship with anybody and you have not disclosed so you can see that these clauses one from the other they run to each other that if you're HIV if you've been tested HIV positive and you have not disclosed and you're probably as adults you're in a relationship with anybody you must first of all disclose so if you don't disclose then you had an attempt you, you, you are intending to transmit to this person Lillian, so you are going to be charged Lillian, our time is first spent but maybe the last one what next for civil society organizations so in terms of uh, what next for us we are actually looking at taking uh, a legal challenge so that we are able to look at uh, the constitution the constitutional court can help us especially look at these clauses which we see are discriminatory in nature and discrim uh, discriminate people living with 
with HIV and AIDS so that we are able to put it into context of our constitution because we believe that every Ugandan has a right to be you know treated equally and in the same way but this act is actually targeting people living with HIV and not only people living with HIV but only those who have come out openly about their status. Lillian Moreko who is the coordinator of the international community of women living with HIV and AIDS. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now moving on, um, the East African Information Security Conference has opened here in Kampala today with concerns among experts and government leaders on how best cybercrime that costs the region economies about $15 million annually, how it can be reversed. Even with the improvements in the cyber legislations among the East African community countries to shake off this vice, Financial institutions, insurance firms, and telecoms are believed to be the key casualties of such colossal losses. A whole spectrum of people ranging from IT professionals to information security experts, to auditors, to accountants, to directors, to managers, the whole spectrum from the sea level to the top level. The crimes that we have reported, especially from a financial angle, you may want to know from a statistical angle, are now in the region of about 10 to 15 million dollars in the region. Okay, loss of, of money. is excessively huge because we have talked over and over again that any organization will always lose money. That is 5% of their annual revenue to fraud. Now, if you look at the general turnover to financial institutions, say, in the 2012 of which was 11 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money which is lost. 5% of that is lost fraud. We have that region of security framework where all our individual countries are hooked, are connected, so that we can act together but we return with more stories White Star Laundry Bath Soap with a lemon fragrance and you'll have a fresh clean day. Be like a star. Use White Star. White Star Laundry Bath Soap. All day fresh clean. Get ready to be counted. Knowing how many we are makes it easy to plan for all of us. So, Answer all questions correctly. Your information is confidential and is only used for equitable resource allocation, improving service delivery and planning. Count for what counts. Starting from 28th August to 6th September 2014, together we count. Ariel claims to give us the best stain removal in one word. So we'll collect tough stains, red sand, fruit juice, chocolate ice cream to see which gives the best stain removal in one wash. We'll wash one half with Ariel and the other with premium detergent. Did the other premium detergent remove these stains? And Ariel? Yes! Ariel, best stain removal in one wash. On the next episode brought to you by At Orange, we know you want to do more on the internet. That's why we bring you happy hour, day and night. So you can find yourself, you bastard. Alcino! Download movies at the lowest prices and never fast from Orange. Dial star 133 hash to buy a data bundle. Happy hour changes with Orange. Today changes with Orange. Welcome back. You're watching NTV at one. Now let's join Gertrude Tumusime Owitwari with our weekly feature, Living Life, to tell us of a man who is 
who is actually getting some money from fetching water. We braved the chilly weather in the wee hours of the morning to get to the home of a popular man in the city suburb of Nansana. Our host John Dikugemana ushered us into his single room that's littered with jerry cans and bicycles. This 55-year-old lives a solitary life after leaving his family of six back home in Rwanda to work in Kampala. Ndikup Gimana has over the years endeared himself to the Nansana residents for fetching them water. This has been his occupation for the past five years since he came from Rwanda. The time I came here, it was the dry season. There is no water on that village. Every, everyone wants water. Then when I came, I see the people, they want water. And in my mind, I said I can go and look when I can get the water. He has started out with six jerrycans and a bicycle, but now has dozens of them. Every night, he ensures he has at least six full jerrycans for his morning customers. People, they need every, every day. That is my business. Can you go for many years? Ndikubge Mana is an early riser who always hits the road before many of his colleagues. Then it's six in the evening. Then I can bring the bicycle here and the jerrycan. Then around the 10, around the 10, I can go to the street again to, to collect the money. Most of his customers are petty traders around the neighborhood. I can use them with the water, then they can pay money in the evening. He fetches the water from his landlord's tank near his house. During the dry seasons, Ndikubgimana fetches up to 150 jerrycans, while in the rainy seasons, he collects between 40 and 60 jerrycans a day. Say one jerrycan for 500 shillings in, in the street. This elderly man fetches water from dawn to dusk and transports it on his cherished bicycle to the doorsteps of his customers. You can sit in, in, in the shop, no one is coming. But my business is not to sit in the shop. Because I am working to see the customer, other they are looking for me. Every time I'm working. The father of six manages to pay his bills and saves money for his family back in Rwanda from this job. While many people of his age are retired and living off the sweat of their children, Muzendi Kubgemana has chosen to toil so as to fend for himself and stay healthy. But it's important for me to train my body because in the manner it is for eating. But if, if I am eating, I, but my, my body is weak, yes, I can die. Five years and still counting, John Dukumana has been fetching water around Nansana. He has cultivated friendship with people he met as strangers. Some of them are now speaking very fondly of him. Every time you want him, he's always around. He comes very early in the morning, so there are no days he does not come. customer, Nikugimana is so passionate about his job and has no plans of getting another one anytime soon. Gertrude to Musime with Kwari, NTV. An encouraging story there. Thank you very much, Gertrude to Musime with Kwari. On to our international scene, Liberia's government has imposed a nationwide night curfew restricting movement between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. in an effort to prevent the spread of the deadly Ebola virus. Now, the epidemic of the hemorrhagic disease has killed nearly 1,300 people in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and has also affected Nigeria. Between August 14th and 16th, Liberia recorded the most new deaths, which are 53 
followed by Sileon with 17 and Gini with 14. The World Health Organization said it was working with the UN's World Food Program to ensure that food is delivered to the one million people living in Ebola quarantine zones cordoned off by the local security forces in the border zone of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Liberia is fighting to stop the spread of the virus in the poorest neighborhoods of its capital, such as the West Point slum, where at the weekend, a rock-throwing crowd attacked and looted a temporary holding center for suspected Ebola cases, 17 of whom fled. Arsene boss Arsene Wenger was angry with the decision to send off Aaron Ramsey as his side drew with Basketat in their Champions League playoff. A new signing, James Rodriguez, scored for his first goal for Real Madrid, but a late Raul Garcia equalizer for Atletico Madrid saw the first leg of the Spanish Super Cup finish 1 to 1 at the Banab. Arsenal's hopes of reaching the lucrative group stages of the Champions League for the 17th successive season are in the balance after an open game in Istanbul ended goalless. Ramsey, who scored a stoppage time winner against Crystal Palace in the Ghana's first Premier League game of the season on Saturday, was sent off with 11 minutes to go. Ramsey's cautions for pulling back Besiktas players mean he will miss the second leg at the Emirates Stadium on Wednesday, the 27th of August. What did you think of Aaron Ramsey's two yellow cards in a very physical game tonight? I think it's not serious. Uh, not the first yellow, not the second yellow. Uh, when you see the number of fouls some players made uh, in their team and that Aaron Ramsey sent off today, uh, I, I do not accept that. Meanwhile, Colombia striker James Rodriguez was making his first appearance at Real's Banabao Stadium, where supporters paid tribute to club legend Alfredo Di Stefano, who died in July before kickoff. Rodriguez came on for Cristiano Ronaldo with a suspected back injury, and the Golden Boot winner at this summer's World Cup netted in the 80th minute. James Rodriguez scores for Real Madrid, the Golden Boy for Colombia in the World Cup with one swipe of the golden boot. But Garcia scrambled the ball home from a corner for the La Liga champions in the dying minutes. Now that winds up NTV at one, be sure to catch us for our subsequent bulletins, including NTV Akaongezi and NTV Tonight. From the entire team, say good afternoon.